Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're uh, calling in from throughout the world. Uh, welcome to the Boston Scientific uh, webcast that's titled Key Factors of a Left Atrial Appendage Closure Program with uh, Asma Husseini. Before I get into the introduction of Asma, what I want to do for the participants on the line is I'll hand things over to uh, uh, Melissa Meredith, who will help us with some logistics in the event you have some questions you would like to ask or submit, and really take us through the protocol of what we're going to try to cover today, and then we'll hand things off to Asma. So, Melissa? Great. Thanks, Nick. So, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, what you should see on your screen right now are some slides, um, and Osman's going to start those off shortly, but a few housekeeping items, as Nick mentioned. Um, there are a couple of ways to ask a question today on the webcast. Uh, you should see a Q&A box where you can go ahead, ask a question, and hit submit. Um, additionally, as some of you are, are already taking advantage of, there is a chat box. Um, the main difference between those two boxes, if you hit uh, or enter a question in the Q&A box, um, that is um, basically anonymous. So only we um, who have the, uh, the ability to answer that question for you can see it. Um, as you are already participating there in the chat, everyone has access to that. Um, we will be uh, monitoring those, so if you have a question throughout the presentation, please don't be shy. Please enter it. Um, and we'll bring those up uh, throughout the presentation as well as after the presentation during uh, Q&A time frame. Additionally, um, if you have any issues, there's a couple of black buttons there at the bottom of the screen that you see. Um, starting on the left, there's a refresh button or a restore button. Um, there's also the ability to do a little audio control on your computer. Um, and then the other buttons also can bring up uh, the slides, the chat, um, the Q&A. Um, as well as Osma's bio. So if you do have any questions uh, throughout the presentation, um, please let us know. Nick? Well, thank you, Melissa. And it looks like we already have a couple of people submitting some communication. And for those of you that are having some technical challenges, uh, we'll try to address them as we uh, go along here with our uh, webmaster. But we're very excited to be uh, able to offer um, a Watchman for Left Atrial Appendage Closure. Since uh, March of this year, uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, of progress that we've been able to make to introduce this to a number of key sites uh, throughout the U.S. And um, as we introduce this, there's a couple of key things that uh, we think are really critical to the success of driving uh, acceptance to this therapy. Obviously, we want to make sure we're selecting the right operators and teams and hospitals. And the role of, uh, of the coordinator is absolutely critical to make sure that all of these advanced uh, structural heart procedures um, are done so in a way that builds the appropriate uh, acceptance of the therapy and outcomes most importantly. And in order to do that, it takes a team of people, the coordinator being a really key role in our success as we move forward, specifically with left atrial appendage closure uh, with the Watchman device. So we want to thank you for your time today. I think this is going to be a great educational opportunity for all of you. And we're very fortunate to have uh, Asma Husseini, who is the Structural Heart uh, and CV Coordinator at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Uh, she's got a wealth of experience. She's been there for over 10 years. And uh, just to give you a little background on um, the specific experience from a Structural Heart standpoint, and Asma can, can, uh, can correct me if I'm incorrect here, but uh, to date, they've done uh, well over 300 uh, Watchman procedures, both in the commercial and in the clinical setting. Commercially, they're doing anywhere between 14 and 15 Watchman cases per month. Uh, and from my understanding, that adoption continues to grow. So they've had a lot of success. And I think what we're going to hear from her today in terms of uh, what they've done to build this program from the ground up, the experience and the, uh, uh, the, the, the dedication and the focus that they've had towards this um, is something I think that can be an experience and an educational opportunity for everyone who's participating. Um, not only are they doing Watchmen, but they're obviously doing uh, some TMVR and some TAVR um, uh, procedures. They do anywhere between uh, 14 and 15 mitra clips, or a total of 380 mitra clips to date. Uh, in terms of TAVR, they're doing 400 TAVR procedures per year. Uh, they have an experience of 1,700 TAVRs to date. So uh, a wealth of experience coming from uh, what is a world-renowned uh, uh, structural heart program at Cedar Medical Center, and Ozma has played a key role in helping uh, with that. And so, Ozma, 
I'll hand things off to you uh, so you can take the uh, participants through the agenda. But we can't thank you enough for, uh, uh, for your help and for your dedication in helping others uh, learn more about the experiences that you have encountered to date. Asma? Good morning, everyone. Uh, Nick, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, you really uh, make me sound good. Um, and I hope everybody's uh, doing well. And thank you for joining in on this webcast. And this is going to be interactive. And as Melissa said earlier, you're going to be able to ask questions. And um, hopefully, you know, you get all your answers. And um, I hope everyone's excited about this technology, because I am. I'm, I was thrilled when the FDA approved it in March. And um, hopefully, all of you will see that it's going to be a wonderful experience for your patients and hopefully for you as you build your careers. Um, today's agenda is going to be understanding, you know, atrial fibrillation and why there's a correlation, you know, with stroke. Um, what's the left atrial appendage, you know, where it is anatomically. I wanted to lay a kind of a foundation so that people understand why this technology is important. What is the reason that we do this procedure? Because I think that's one of the key points when we're communicating with physicians, with patients, and you know, with other hospital staff. I think if everyone is on the same page, it just makes for a better experience. Uh, we'll go over what it takes to develop you know, a left atrial appendage closure program. And then we'll review what some of the pre- and post-procedure best practices are. Everybody seeing the slides OK? So atrial fibrillation is a growing problem. It's associated with greater morbidity and mortality. There is a higher risk of stroke for older patients, and especially for those patients that already have a history of stroke or TIA. Approximately 15 to 20 percent of all strokes are related to atrial fibrillation. Um, the strokes that result from this are usually um, you know, more morbid, they cause greater disability than compared to non-atrial fibrillation related strokes. There is a five times greater risk of stroke in patients that have atrial fibrillation. There's approximately five million Americans that have atrial fibrillation and this number is expected to grow. Um, as you can see, it's expected to double by the year 2050. So here we see um, what the left atrial appendage looks like, and we see a thrombus in there. This is how you would see it on a transesophageal echocardiogram. And we'll go over this more. Um, you know, stasis-related left atrial appendage thrombus is the number one predictor for stroke. Um, it is the source of over 90% of the strokes that occur in patients that have atrial fibrillation. The left atrial appendage, it is a remnant of the embryonic left atrium, and you'll see in, on the next slide we'll show you. It's a finger-like projection that comes off of the left atrium. It has variations in size, shape, and its relationship with addition structures. It can be two or more lobes, um, and usually appendages that have multiple lobes are associated with a higher risk of stroke. Um, the appendage shares a close relationship to the left circumflex artery, the left superior vein posteriorly, and then the mitral valve medially. It's a single layer of tissue with pectinate muscles of variable thickness. You'll see um, it's, it's very friable, and this is the reason why you know, this procedure um, has some associated complications with it, um, although that it's pretty rare, but you'll see anatomically why that's important. And the appendage plays an important role in regulation of heart rate and fluid balance. But this role tends to go away. As patients develop atrial fibrillation, the appendage behaves more like a sac and doesn't really have a function. And that's why we can occlude it. That's why in surgery they can ligate it. And it, it doesn't cause any problems for the patient. So anatomically here we can see um, the left atrium is very smooth, and the left atrial appendage, as I said, comes off of the superior um, section here of the left atrium. It 
has an opening and that opening can be small or, or larger and that's why the Watchman device you'll see later comes in multiple sizes. And I tell patients that we size the appendage, measure you know how deep it is, how wide the mouth of the appendage is, and that determines the size that we use to implant. And you can see where it is in comparison to the mitral valve. And uh, here you see um, the other components here. We won't go over this too much in detail. Let me move to the next slide. This is a left atrial appendage and showing you the different shapes that are possible. The cauliflower shape is the one that's associated with the highest risk of stroke because you can see it has multiple lobes there. And um, this is the way it looks on the top row. You can see how it looks on a TEE. The middle row shows you how it looks on an angiogram under fluoro. This is typically um, what they do when they do the procedure. They put a pigtail catheter inside the appendage and inject dye, and they can see how many lobes there are. They can see the mouth of the appendage, how wide it is, and they make measurements on these views. The bottom row shows you how the appendage looks on CT. And these are the four shapes that were um, labeled. And this, this was something that uh, cardiologists got together and, and uh, they were able to classify these shapes. So this slide again just shows you that as the size you know, of the appendage increases, it loses the biphasic emptying pattern, and this causes it to have decreased contractility. The pouch functions as a static tissue of pouch, and then this is what causes it to develop thrombus within there. And it is a source of thrombus in over 90% of patients. Here again, this is showing you the connection between the appendage, and um, this is, you know, how the clot can come out and go to the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle, and then from there it can go to the brain and cause a stroke. In 2001, there was a method developed um, to calculate a patient's risk of stroke annually, and it was ch called the CHADS-2 score. And this was a point system developed, and you can see C stands for congestive heart failure, H, hypertension, H greater than 75, diabetes, and then history of prior stroke gives you a point system of two. So you can see here, um, depending on what their CHADS-2 score is, this predicts their annual risk of stroke. The higher the CHADS-2 score, the higher the risk of stroke. In 2010, there was further refinement of this scoring system, and the CHADS VAS scoring system was developed. And this is the one that's more commonly used now. This is the system that I use when I see patients, and this is what gets dictated in all the consult reports. Here in this system, patients get two points. For age greater than 75, they get two points, and that's why you have that two um, with the A. And then you also get um, a point if you're female. Females have a higher risk of stroke, so you get one more point for that. And then you also have a point for vascular disease or coronary disease. And then so you have a total maximum score of nine with this system. In 2014, the American Heart Association, ACC and HRS, created that guidelines um, to help physicians decide which patients should be on anticoagulation therapy. If you have a score of one, you can recommend a patient to take aspirin, or you can also consider anticoagulants. But for patients that have a CHADS-VAS score of at least two, they should be on anticoagulation therapy. They have an annual stroke risk of anywhere from 2 to 15%. Oral anticoagulation is the standard, but it's not ideal for everyone. We know that patients that are on warfarin or coumadin 
Um, you know, they complain of having to take the medication every day. They complain of bleeding problems, easy bruising. Um, you know, they have labile INRs, meaning it's difficult for them to get therapeutic ranges with their INR. And there's food interactions. And then there's complications, of course, when you are planning to do elective surgery, they have to be bridged sometimes. Um, and you have that period where they're at increased risk just before surgery or after surgery. And even with the newer oral anticoagulants, you have the same risk. And one of the main, main things that I always point out to patients is that these medications lack reversal agents. One important thing that we must uh, look at also is that many, you know, of the, the risk factors for stroke are also risk factors for bleeding. Advanced age is, is causes patients to bleed more. Uh, uncontrolled hypertension is a risk of bleeding. Um, and patients are anemic and often have, you know, history of GI bleeding. Kidney or liver dysfunction is something that causes patients to bleed more. And then, of course, our patients that have coronary stents, especially drug-eluting stents that are on antiplatelet agents, they have a much higher risk of stroke when you combine these medications with anticoagulant therapy. The HASBED scoring system was developed in 2010, and this looks at all these features that we were just discussing, and it's a point system again, and you, you score a patient's risk of bleeding if they have any of these factors, hypertension or uncontrolled hypertension, I should say, uh, abnormal renal or liver function, um, history of prior stroke is actually an increased risk of bleeding. Um, if they've had a bleed, you know, anywhere before in the brain or GI bleeding, this, this is going to make them at increased risk to have another bleed. Labile INRs, patients elder, who are elderly, uh, drug or alcohol use, these are all factors that predict a patient's risk of bleeding. And this is one of the things that should be mentioned in the notes. If you don't have the has blood score per se, but you have all these elements dictated in the report, then you should be fine. And when you're, you know, filling out the registry forms that we're going to talk about later, um, you can still get these numbers. So despite the new oral anticoagulants, um, patients are still reluctant to take these medications, and you can see that um, approximately 50% of patients that should be on anticoagulant therapy are not taking it. So there's an unmet need that because there's a relative or absolute contraindication. And as I said, this is saying 40%, but I usually even see higher uh, many of these patients that um, should be on medications. They just can't take medications and they're not taking anticoagulants and they're at risk of stroke. So again, uh, we're not going to go over this too much, but you saw that thrombus in the appendage is, is the reason for stroke in these patients, and uh, anticoagulants are just underused. And that's why Watchman therapy is so important. It's the first of its kind proven alternative to long-term warfarin therapy for stroke risk reduction in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. It's the most studied device out there. It's the only one proven with long-term data from randomized trials or multi-centered registries. It's commercially available internationally since 2009, and I'm sure this number is much higher now, uh, and I don't have that number, but uh, I'm sure they can tell you later. It is registered all over the world, in Europe, in Asia. This procedure is being done. It's the Watchman device is indicated to reduce the risk of thromboembolism from the left atrial appendage in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation who are at increased risk for stroke and systemic embolism based on the CHADS-2 or CHADS-VAS scores and are recommended for anticoagulation therapy and are deemed by their physicians to be suitable for warfarin and have an appropriate rationale to seek a non-pharmacologic alternative to warfarin. 
taking into account the safety and effectiveness of the device compared to warfarin. It's not intended to be a broad replacement for oral anticoagulants. Uh, and many of the patients that I see on a daily basis, they have appropriate rationale to seek non, you know, medical therapy. And um, but if you if you have something, you know, if you have evidence that they've bled on previous uh, medications that all needs to be stated clearly for, um, you know, coverage purposes. Um, next, we'll talk about, you know, now that we understand what this is, how do you build a program? So the first steps in building a program is to identify who are the administrative stakeholders, and you know, these are people at the top, um, the director of your heart program, your structural program needs to be involved. Um, and everyone needs to sit down and figure out, you know, what is this going to take? Um, is this going to take, you know, additional rooms in cath labs that are dedicated? Um, is this going to take additional um, clinical space to see these patients? Set up the meeting early in the process. And you want to educate what this therapy is and why it's important for patients how it's going to affect patient quality of life, and talk about the halo effect. And this is going to be increased referrals. And it may not just be increased referrals just for Watchmen. It may bring you know, other referrals, too, especially if you have a center that where you're doing valve therapies already. You're going to see that many of these same patients are also appropriate for Watchmen therapy. And the benefits are that, you know, it's a new option for patients who need it. Uh, it improves patients' quality of life. Um, you want to be, you know, first in line, right? When, when patients are looking for a place to get their procedure, um, they're going to go to the hospital who has done the most number of cases. And the way you get ahead is by starting the program early and getting your numbers in. Um, you want to be competitive in the market. And, you know, with hospitals looking at the bottom line, I think this is going to be a very important place to be for a hospital who wants to be distinguished. This is a therapy that they'll have to have. Um, this reflects on the procedural expertise of the physicians, the nurses, and cat lab staff. And if you're a comprehensive structural program, you need this therapy to be included. The communication um, with the stakeholders starts, um, as I said, at the administration level, and then, of course, finance uh, with purchasing the device, uh, making sure that you have resources, including staff, um, support staff, meaning whether it's cath lab staff or the unit staff, they all need to understand that this therapy is coming and what it's about. Uh, diagnostic department, especially the echo lab, is going to see an increased volume. They're going to see lots of TE orders coming in, and they'll have to understand what this therapy is about. Early on, this was probably about eight years ago already, I had to sit down and meet with the echo lab nurses and tell them, you know, why am I ordering all these TEs on these patients? And so I went over the procedure. I explained to them what we're looking for. So if they understand, then, then they'll be more willing to, you know, give you that TE spot if it's the last spot that's open and you really need this patient to have their 45 follow-up TE done. They're going to be more reasonable with you and allow you to squeeze that patient into their schedule if they know why it's so important. Um, externally, you want to talk to your referring physicians. Um, I make calls on a daily basis with my referring physicians. Um, just yesterday, I spoke to a neurologist who referred us a patient for Watchman therapy who had an intracranial bleed. And, you know, he didn't know. He thought the patient could just be off of everything and just get the device put in. And then, you know, they have to be educated. What is the weaning process of anticoagulant therapy after the procedure? Patients, of course, need a lot of education and communication. The family needs to understand. Um, and then, 
you know, social media, that's something that your hospital can handle how they want to advertise the procedure, what they want to do, whether it's letters that are going out to referring physicians or if it's a media campaign that your hospital might do. Those are all things that will be helpful in building a program. So the key aspects of a successful team, of course, is going to begin with the physician who's invested and who's a champion for the therapy. And of course, you know, ex his extenders, whether they're nurse practitioners or PAs like me, they must understand the, the technology and believe in the technology. And then, you know, people involved in the procedural aspects in cath lab, um, the nurses, the echo nurses, as I said, these people all need to be very good and understand the technology. You need a clinic that flows efficiently. Scheduling is key. If you get a patient referral and you wait and don't get them in, they may go somewhere else. Or, you know, they may say, oh, maybe this is not such a good procedure after all. So you, you want to catch them as soon as they give you that call. And then always remember to keep your referring physicians happy. Again, um, same thing, you know, you need a program coordinator. And it doesn't matter whether you have four people doing each of these things or you have one person. And initially, you may be that only person that's doing all these things. You may be seeing the patient. You may be scheduling them. You may be collecting the data. And as your program grows, then you can add additional people to feed, fit each one of these roles. Uh, I know when I started in Structural Heart in 2005, 2006, we started Watchmen. Um, I was doing all these things. I was scheduling the TEs. I was scheduling the consults. I was collecting the data. But now, you know, things are different, of course, and there's people that are helping me. But initially, you're going to be working pretty hard, possibly, to get your program started. Where do you get patients? Now, the best way is if you get a direct referral, right? If the patient says, oh, I heard that there's this watchman. My friend has watchman. I want to, you know, what is it? And they come to you directly. Um, then, of course, you have a primary cardiologist. And we get a lot of um, general cardiologists who refer us patients. We have some internists and general practitioners who refer patients. And then um, Coumadin Clinic is not such a great source for us. I um, don't send any patients to Coumadin Clinic, but I know there's a lot of places that have a large Coumadin Clinic, and they may refer patients. Um, stroke team definitely st refers us patients. The patient I spoke about earlier uh, was referred to us from the neurologist. And then we have some EP or you know other cardiologists that also refer us patients. This is a timeline that I like to use, and this is something that we found helpful with, um, you know, when you were doing mitral clip patients as well. Um, you want to try to get these patients treated early, and it's not that we're rushing them into therapy. It's just that when patients decide to come for a therapy, uh, they're in that mindset of, you know, I want this therapy, and sometimes delaying in the scheduling of these things can make them change their mind or, you know, they may have an event during that time. They may go to other hospitals during that time. So it's important that you get the patient in early. From the minute you get that referral from the doctor, make sure you call the patient within the first two to three days to say, yes, we got the records and we'll be scheduling you for your appointment. And ideally, you want to get them on the schedule to be seen within seven days. And I try to get an echo on these patients most of the time, especially, you know, with now elderly patients, they may have valve disease that may be a contraindication for them getting watchmen, if, you know, if they have mitral stenosis or if they have aortic stenosis that needs to be treated. Um, and then also patients with a history of stroke, try to have their baseline imaging uh, records sent to you um, so that you're not repeating studies. And then as soon as you see the patient, start the authorization process, because sometimes this can take four to six weeks. Um, within 10 days, 
you know, we try to tell the patient, okay, we're planning to do your procedure, you know, on such and such day, is that going to work for you? And usually what I'm finding is that I can do their pre-op visit at the time of their consult. I can do their labs, I can do the EKG, send them for chest x-ray, and then put them on the schedule within the first two to three weeks or maximum one month out. That way everything is done and patients are not coming back and forth. And that first visit is really a very detailed visit because not only are you explaining the therapy, you're also explaining to them what's going to happen post-procedure. And this is going to be, you know, you'll have your TE at 45 days and, you know, this is what we're going to do. We'll take you off of Coumadin and then you'll go on Plavix. So it's all this education that needs to happen up front so that there are no surprises. Oh, Asma, it's Rick. I, I, a question came through um, regarding okay. um, how you consent for Watchmen if you have a particular okay. order set. Do you use a, a general consent like you do for other structural heart procedures, or do you have something specific to Watchmen? Um, our consent um, that we have is a generic consent form, and the way and we use the Epic uh, order set, which is an electronic data set. And it's consent for left atrial appendage closure with implant. That's the way it's worded. Okay, using Epic. Thank you. Mm hmm Yeah. We don't have paper documents anymore. Um, so obtaining authorization, this is can be a pretty difficult task and you know, I've had to go through three steps sometimes before I get the authorization completed. First, you want to give a complete clinical picture, um, you know, in the consult note, as I was saying earlier. Make sure you put the chat bath score in there. Um, what are the patient's risk factors for bleeding? And then once that initial authorization is submitted, oftentimes you'll get a request for a peer-to-peer -peer review. And this is something that I do as a PA all the time, and I'm sure many of you guys do this too. You're talking to a physician, and this is a first level, and this may not be a cardiologist on that phone. It's just whoever that you know physician reviewer is. And most of the time, they're going to deny the procedure. And then they're going to tell you, well, I'm just the initial person, and I can't approve this because this is an investigational procedure. And then they'll give you the you know person uh, or a fax number where you need to write your appeal letter. And then the appeal letter, you want to put, of course, that same information, more detail. And then usually with that second appeal, you can get an approval. Sometimes if even after that second um, appeal, if you get a denial, then what happens is it gets sent outside of the insurance company to like an outside reviewer and then after the third one, we've had approvals come in, and this has been for our Blue Cross patients that I've seen that happen to. Um, and, you know, the main thing in this is just keeping your patients informed and let them know what the status is and let them know that, you know, yes, you got denied and we're working on it and just keep them in the loop. So when you're communicating with the referring physician, make sure they have a number so they know where to call you or make sure they have, you know, usually they still call me. I will give them the scheduler's phone number, but because I've been in this department so long, many of the physicians know my number and they'll call me directly. Um, you know, let them know that you're going to return their patients back to them. Um, most of the physicians are fine with, uh, many of them want me to you know, do the INR monitoring as well, and that's something kind of I decide from patient to patient. Some patients I just feel are better managed with their referring doctor. Some referring doctors say, no, I want you to manage the Coumadin for my patient. So it just depends what they want. Um, let them know and send records after the procedure so that they know that the procedure has been completed. Um, and then uh, one thing that we like to do is invite referring physicians to the procedure if they want to come and watch. Um, I think that's a good idea. And then now we'll talk about this, I think, a little later, but 
this is very important, you know, tracking data because it's going to affect the bottom line and it's going to affect whether your hospital gets reimbursed for the procedure or not. Um, keeping uh, this data is going to help, you know, develop, develop um, the plan, I mean, the program further and if your department, you know, needs to hire additional help, then they'll know, okay, we're doing this many cases per month, we need to, get, you know, hire more people. Um, and it's going to be helpful so you know what your outcomes are. We need to track patients um, for, you know, any post-procedure adverse events such as neurologic events or bleeding events, those all need to be captured. Um, and then what do you collect when you, when you look at this data? You want to make sure you get the procedure detail, what size device was used. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, procedural detail is captured by uh, the Boston person that comes and is captured in our um, CATH report in the dictations that are done from the procedure. Um, and then in the follow-up notes, of course, as I said, you want to document any hospitalizations, especially hospitalizations for recurrent stroke or TIA. Um, and then if there's any deaths, of course, capture what, is, what was the reason, what happened to this patient. Um, the has blood scores, thrombus, all these things need to be captured in the report. Hey, Asma. There was a question um, kind of going back to the patients being scheduled and regarding okay. the oral anticoagulant they're on um, at okay. the initial visit, you know, whether they're on a warfarin or one of the other oral anticoagulants. Um, I don't know if you can maybe yeah, address. Yeah, I'm going to go into the pre- and post-procedure workup of the patients, and I'm going to be going over that actually at that point. Okay. Okay. All right. Sure. So uh, many of the patients, as I said, will come from the same um, referring physicians that send you your valve patients, mitroclip or TAVR patients. Um, educational events that we do um, have, you know, given us a lot of patients, especially the um, outreach dinners that my physician does. Uh, he did one in the Vegas area and we get a lot of patients from Las Vegas now. Uh, there was a Boston-sponsored um, radio um, promotion that was done and we, we get a lot of patients that come to us from that. So these are all things that your hospital can consider. Um, here, this is what I was going to get into next, which is the pre and post procedure and I know we may have a lot of questions in this section. So um, important, as I said, is um, to get an echo and, you know, you are going to have that rare patient. Uh, I had one yesterday with an EF of 20%. Now in the clinical trial phase, patients with an ejection fraction of less than 30% were excluded for Watchmen and, and that's not a, you know, contraindication anymore because it's it's FDA approved and there's nothing in the FDA indication that says you can't treat a patient with an EF of less than 30%. But just know that these patients are going to be prone to, you know, developing thrombus and, and they may require just closer monitoring afterwards. Um, the TEs we, at our institution, we don't do them pre-procedure, but that's something that your physician is going to have to decide. If you have a patient who hasn't been on Coumadin, and they have, or, or any anticoagulants, and they have a long-standing history of atrial fibrillation, I think it may be worth it to get the TE, make sure that there's not a thrombus in that appendage, because the last thing you want to do is put the patient to sleep for a procedure, and then you can't do the procedure on them. So definitely get the TEs before. And then always review if a patient has had prior surgery. Um, this has happened. Uh, you know, maybe once or twice at our place where we have a patient who had mitral valve surgery many years ago. We were not able to obtain the surgical report and of course the patient doesn't know that they've had their appendage ligated and then at the time of the procedure we find out they don't have, an, uh, you know, an open appendage to implant the device. So again, that pre-procedure T is really helpful and, and should be done. Um, especially at new centers starting their program.
And then, um, you know, case selection, this is kind of something more that they do at the time of the procedure. They'll decide, you know, what size device to use depending on the size, how many lobes there are, uh, whether there's clots. Uh, we don't ever implant a Watchman device on patients that already have a clot sitting in the appendage because when we pass a wire in there, it's going to throw that clot around and, you know, put the patient at risk for having a stroke during the procedure. Patients that have, uh, again, uh, significant um, mitral valve disease, mitral, you know, stenosis, aortic stenosis, these patients should not have Watchman. They should get their valve disease treated first and then have Watchman. Um, and Asma, a couple mm -hmm. of folks were curious um, how you decide when you do the pre-op um, TEE. At, at what point do you recommend when I that? See, when I see them for the consult and I see that the patient hasn't been on Coumadin or any, any form of anticoagulant therapy, and especially if they have chronic AFib, they're in AFib, um, you know, at the time of their consult, um, they have especially if they have some LV dysfunction, they have an enlarged left atrium. These are all risk factors that are going to predispose them to having thrombus in the appendage. So these patients, I would bring them back for a pre-procedure TEE, uh, do the TEE, make sure there's not thrombus in there, and then if it's clear, schedule them for the procedure shortly thereafter. Yes. You know, so in Clinical phases, yes. you remember we used to require a TE to be done 48 hours uh, before the procedure. Yes. Yeah. And now in the commercial setting, do you, you try to stick to that or just within a no, week? No, we, we, don't, we don't do it. I mean, it's pretty rare for me um, to order a TE to be done uh, ahead of the procedure because, like I said, we are doing them on the table. But many of my patients... Um, I screen them again to make sure um, that you know what, what is what does their atrium look like. If they have a lot of smoke, um, you can usually get an idea sometimes just from a transthoracic echo um, that you know this patient's going to be problematic. It's, it's sure. something I guess you you learn more, and your physician's going to have to make a decision. Sometimes you know some patients are so frail that even doing a TEE is a burden for them and it is an invasive procedure and um, you know if, if you don't think there's going to be a problem you know no thrombus in the appendage it may be safer to just do it at the time of the procedure but it's something that you can decide patient by patient sure thank you are you guys, are you guys requiring sites to have a TEE done before implant no, but it's it, it's good peace of mind for some of the newer centers starting up. A lot of times they like to have a, an idea or a, a you know a pre-case review on you know what kind mm -hmm. of anatomy is going to present. You know, okay. you guys with your higher volume and experience, you know, maybe are more comfortable just jumping in. You know, regardless, you know, you're taking all comers regardless of anatomy, and yes. others would prefer to have a, a preview and, and take those considerations um, yeah. beforehand. Early on, um, many years ago, when we first started the program, we had a patient who, um, you know, we took to the procedure, and her appendage was just a very shallow, wide mouth appendage, and we could not fit a device. And that's the only patient I remember where we were not able to an, implant a device. So, because you have the, you know, multiple sizes available. Um, I think, you know, this device is, is pretty accommodating for most shapes, right? I mean, it's yeah. pretty rare for you not to be able to fit a device in the in there. That's true. I, I could have Nino weigh in. He's our, you know, top clinical uh, person. But I, it is pretty rare that we have a screen failure and, you know, at the time um, having that patient getting ruled out. Due to anatomy, meaning, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, and that, an anatomical or... Um, you know, thrombus for that matter. Yeah, I think thrombus I agree. is more common. Uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely thrombus, and I think it also has to do with experience as well. So I think for newer centers, first starting off, it's always a good idea to, to do the pre-procedure TE. Yeah. So this is just showing you some um, TE images of an appendage, what it looks like, and you can see this is a nice ticking wing-shaped appendage. There's no thrombus in there, so 
this this would be a perfect you know scenario. So uh, the pre-procedure visit, as I said, um, you know, get the labs. Definitely um, make sure that the hemoglobin, hematocrit are okay. Uh, ideally, we don't take patients for a procedure with the hemoglobin less than 10. Try to get it to 10. I mean, if it's a patient that has chronically uh, low hemoglobin, hematocrit, um, there are rare exceptions, you know, where we, we implant patients with the hemoglobin of 8 or 9. Um, another thing is the creatinine. Um, you know, this is a procedure that requires contrast, right? So make sure you know what their baseline creatinine is. That's something that's going to be tracked for the registry that will be required. So definitely do a baseline creatinine and let patients know that, you know, they, they may have a bump in their creatinine. This procedure may affect their renal function, um, and, and that is a risk that should be, you know, up front. Um, but let them know that we minimize the contrast. The contrast use is variable, but definitely for patients that have renal insufficiency, you can get away using minimal contrast, usually, you know, 30 to 50 cc's minimum. Um, this is a thing you asked about earlier about the um, anticoagulant therapy. We don't bridge patients. My boss, Dr. Seibelkar, doesn't like to bridge patients with Lovenox, but that's something that you need to discuss with your individual physicians. I generally have them hold their Coumadin um, for three days, and we can implant the device with an INR around two or just below two. Um, the newer anticoagulants, we hold them for 48 hours, or so two days, um, instruct them to be NPO, um, hold medications on the morning of the procedures except for inhalers, um, assess for infections, injuries. You know, sometimes I have patients call and, and they say, oh, I have a little bit of a cold or cough. Um, you know, but if it's something that if they don't have fever, they're still, you know, up and around doing most activities and doing this kind of procedure is not going to, you know, this is, this is not like a valve implant um, that's going to put them at risk for infection or anything. So this is a little bit more forgivable than doing like a TAVR patient or a mitral clip patient where they're having an implant on their valve. Hey, Osman, this is Melissa. Mm -hmm. We've had a um, couple of questions, just like you predicted, okay. coming in. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the questions is, what are you doing with patients that are not on an OAC at the initial visit? Are you starting warfarin at that time? No, um, I I'm, make sure that they're on at least aspirin therapy before the procedure, but no, I don't start them beforehand. Um, if you're planning to do the procedure soon, you know, like I said, within the two weeks, two to three weeks after seeing the patient, I, I don't think it's really worth it to start and then stop them. If they're not on it, there probably is a good reason why they're not on it. Usually the referring physician um, hasn't put them on it because they have a risk of bleed. And, um, you know, if, if you know for a fact that this patient may have a big problem because of GI history or something and you want to try them on Coumadin, you can do that, but in general, we're not doing that. We're starting Coumadin after we implant the device, or we don't put them on before. And so I think another um, related question, and I think you, you said this again, but a good question to mm -hmm. ask again. So if they're on a NOAC, are you transitioning mm -hmm. them to warfarin at the consult visit? No, I'm not, no. I have them stop the NOAC before the procedure, two days before the procedure and then just make sure that they know they're not going to go back on that NOAC after the procedure, they'll be starting Coumadin. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I use the procedure booklets that Boston Scientific has made. I think they're excellent. Um, I give this to each patient and I run out of them all the time. Um, a lot of the patients come in already having viewed the animation online. There's lots of things online that the patient can usually look up on their own, but if they're interested, then I show them the animation online as well. I usually draw a lot of pictures for patients. That's what I do. I use the back of my progress note, um, and I draw a picture of the heart with the four chambers, show them where the appendage is, show them the correlation to 
you know, the aorta and, and the vessels leading up to the brain, and, and they get a very clear picture of, you know, why this therapy is important. I'll remind them that this is a general anesthesia procedure. It's not something that can be done on sedation, and that's because they need to have a TEE during the procedure. Um, I've had a patient or two say, oh, but I have horrible experience with anesthesia. Can I do it without? And it's no, absolutely not. Um, they do need antibiotics before the procedure, um, and then I'll show you later, but we give antibiotics uh, post-procedure as well. Um, we keep the patient heparinized during the procedure with an ACT greater than 250. Um, we don't use a Foley catheter at our institution because these procedures are very quick, anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes. And I think our procedures have been consistently like around 30 minutes. So we don't use a Foley catheter anymore, but we did initially when we started the program. We use a per-close for the groin hemostasis. Um, the device is prepped by our cath lab staff or by the, you know, interventional fellows that are scrubbed on the procedure. And it's a pretty easy device prep. It's not something that requires extensive training. Hey, Asma, just to break in again, a um, couple more questions for you. I think um, going back to, to talking about the bridging and, and patient management pre-procedure. Um, uh -huh. One of the questions that's come in, um, just to reiterate, are you bridging with Lovenox after the procedure until they're therapeutic? We are not, no. We, we, we haven't had any issues, to be honest. You know, we, we've not had any problems with uh, any patients having us. TIA or any events, you know, in that post-procedure hospital admission time. Um, we give them Coumadin the same day after the procedure is completed, um, and then they, re they take it. We don't make them therapeutic before discharge. I know there are a lot of institutions where, you know, physicians tend to be more consider conservative and they do that. that that's going to be something that, you know, they can decide to do. Um, I don't think there's any right or wrong way of doing it. Um, it's just going to depend on the institution and the doctor performing the procedure. But we at Cedars do not we keep them. We discharge them the next morning. And then we have them follow up with an INR in three or four days. Gotcha. Gotcha. Another question came through then. Are, um, are you reversing the heparin after the procedure? Um, most of the time, no. It's pretty rare for us to d reverse the heparin um, because these are patients, you know, that are more prone to developing thrombus. I think if, if we have, um, you know, a complication, and we've had, over the course of 10 years, we've had maybe two or three patients that have had pericardial bleeding post-procedure, and in those patients, we reverse the heparin. Or in patients where there may be a groin issue and, you know, there's they're continuing to bleed or something from the groin, then um, we'll reverse it, but we don't do it on a routine basis. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, semi-related, another question that came through here is, um, do you have any collaboration with the, the neurologist or, or the GI physician um, to get clearance for, for the medications if they're not currently on OIC? Uh, most patients that come in at the time of their consult that have a history of GI bleeding, they'll have a GI physician of their own. So, yes, I do send them back to their physician, and I make sure that, you know, they meet with them and get cleared to be on Coumadin post-procedure if they're not already on it. And then also, same thing with the neurologist, um, the patient I spoke about earlier with the history of, uh, inner, you know, bleed in the brain. Um, I spoke to the neurologist, and um, generally they clear the patient after six to eight weeks of, you know, after having a bleed, they get a CT scan which shows, you know, resolving of that bleed, and once they're cleared by neurology, then we can implant the device. Gotcha. And a couple other questions here. They're um, hot topics, as you know, and they want to hear what, what, uh, what your experience is. So another question. Um, so uh, we want to, sorry, I'm reading the question. Um, so do be, to be clear, um, do you schedule the uh, Watchman implant without pre-procedure TEE to make sure they pass the screen? And that's coming from somebody who's, who's just started their program, so want to know what, what your best practice is there. 
if you, if the patient is on anticoagulant at the time of the consult, then I think it's pretty safe to schedule them for the procedure without a pre-procedure TE. Okay. And then in that case, are you taking the device? Um, are you doing the device sizing in that during that TEE? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's a one. Ninety-nine percent of our patients are going home the next day. Uh, it's pretty rare. Um, I think just one patient recently who had a pericardial bleed uh, post procedure. He ended up staying two extra days, uh, but most of them go home the next day. Uh, they go to a tele unit, not not ICU, um, because this is a venous procedure, not an arterial procedure. They only require four hours of bed rest post procedure. So it's not like they're lying there for hours and hours afterwards. Yeah. And how do you, a question um, came in actually via email here, how do mm -hmm. you um, manage expectations or communicate with the referring physician um, to make sure that if it is going to be longer than the, the one day hospital stay that you previously communicated, how do you kind of manage those expectations? Um, I tell the patient and then, you know, I think the physicians usually are not too concerned about how many days the patient's going to be in the hospital. They're more concerned about, okay, you know, do they need to be on Coumadin before? And then if they're, you know, on Coumadin after, who's going to manage their INRs? You know, where is the patient going to get their blood testing done? Those are the things that I usually have a problem with or, you know, I need to communicate that with the referring physicians so that they know. And then sometimes these patients that are on NOACs and they have no experience with being on Coumadin, um, th those tend to be a little bit more difficult, you know, challenging to deal with, uh, both in terms of, you know, speaking with the physician, because the physician probably put them on the NOAC so that they didn't have to be bothered with the blood testing and monitoring of INR, right? So the last thing they want to do is, you know, refer a patient to you, and then you start Coumadin, and then, you know, they're having to manage the INR, they, they may not have the time in their practice to do that. So those patients, um, I end up taking care of that for the six weeks that they're on Coumadin. Gotcha. And then I think a, a related question that just came in, for, uh, for recent uh, major bleeding on warfarin, or if they have recent major bleeding on warfarin, are uh -huh. you um, putting any patients on DAPT therapy post-procedurally then? No, we're not. No. Um, I, we, we're trying to stay very clean, and, and I think, you know, for the registry purposes, too, until we get, you know, clear reimbursement, uh, you know, and things look good, uh, we get a green light, then we may be able to charter into those areas, but my physician has decided that we are not going to do that with anybody. Everybody's going on Coumadin post-procedure. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, these patients do require hydration post-procedure because they get contrast. Make sure that you flush them out by giving them four to six hours of um, IV fluids. Make sure you get a creatinine in the morning because this is something that's going to be tracked again on that registry. They're going to track for highest creatinine post-procedure, so make sure those labs are, uh, you know, ordered for the morning. Um, we give antibiotic therapy. There's, there's really no, I guess, um, studies or, uh, or clinical, you know, background for this practice, but it's something that was done in the study or the clinical phase of this device, and so we're carrying that on over. Um, we give them a dose, you know, before and then two doses post-procedure at 6 and 12 hours post. And then we don't order echoes routinely on these patients. Um, it's only like that patient who may have a complication with the bleed post-procedure, those are the only ones that get routine echoes. Otherwise, no echo is required for these patients. The follow-up 45-day um, TE is, is critical. It's, you know, very important. And we have a window, um, you know, sometimes I, want, I have patients that want to get off Coumadin sooner and they may come in for their follow-up TE at like 35 days or 40 days, you know. So I think a few days early is fine. Some um, come, you know, a few days later. But one thing that I try to 
stick to is make sure they stay on that Coumadin until that TE is done and you're clearing them and you make sure that there's no you know, clot on the device, make sure there's no shunting into the appendage, and then take them off of Coumadin. Um, and then lots of education, again, about making sure they continue their Coumadin afterwards. I have them avoid heavy exertion for a month post-procedure because it is an implant. And, and you want you know it to endothelialize. You want scar tissue to form. So no activities like golf, tennis, no heavy exertion for one month post procedure. Asma, then are you doing any more TEEs after the 45 days? One year, 45 days and one year. Okay, and then and the one year is a TEE, not just a transthoracic, correct? TEE, absolutely, yeah. And you know, if, then, if there's shunting into the appendage, now we've not had any cases like that where we have uh, more than a five millimeter shunt into the appendage. But if they have that at, at their 45 day follow up T, then they should get one at six months. And then sometimes, you know, that the, that shunt may get smaller. So I think you know we had one patient during the clinical trial phase where they had a shunt into the appendage at 45 days, but then when we repeated the study at six months, then that shunt was gone and then we took them off of Coumadin. So that's pretty rare for that to happen. I don't have much experience with that, but um, I mean, the majority of them, you know, 99 out of 100 patients come off of their Coumadin on their 45-day visit follow-up TE. Somebody was also asking whether or not you require surgical backup. No, no surgical backup. I mean, we, you know, as, as a standard protocol for all cath lab um, procedures, we obtain a consent for emergent open heart surgery. And so we, we don't have surgical backup, but, you know, at a big institution like Cedars, you know, we, we have surgeons that are here all the time, right? I mean, there's, but, but we don't keep like an OR designated as backup or anything. We don't keep, we don't do that for this procedure. And we've not required anything like that in the last 10 years that we've been implanting this device. Yeah. And Nino and Rick, I know that, um, that you also work with, with other accounts that maybe don't have the wealth of experience that Ozma and Dr. Carr and the other implanting physicians at Scripps do. Um, do you find that, especially with a newer program, that having surgical backup is is a part of the plan? Um, you know, not uh, immediate surgical backup, but um, obviously just standard cat lab procedures as far as um, having surgical availability if, uh, if need be. Yeah, every account does need to have, you know, that, that, like Nina said, surgical backup um, available. But again, it does not mean you have a, you know, cardiothoracic surgeon standing by on call. It's not like that. It's, you know, just a center that has that. Yeah. And likewise, a question has come in. Um, Ozma, do you, do you have a cell saver standing by as part of the um, No, we don't. No. It's, it's extremely rare for our patients to require blood transfusion. Actually, that's an important point in the pre-op. I didn't have that, but I do type and screen these patients. Um, and for many years, I think I just stopped doing it in the last year, but I would type and cross-match patients for two units of blood just as a precaution. So try, type and cross-match for two units. And we've not, I'm not of 300 cases that we've done, maybe we required a blood transfusion like two times. So it's extremely rare. So in summary, understanding prevalence of atrial fibrillation and treatment options is the foundation for building a strong program. Um, a cohesive heart team model and scheduling efficiency leads to growth of the program and the number of patients treated. And then careful attention to pre- and post-procedure care is critical to procedural success. Um, so I'm going to just uh, go to the next slide. And these are um, three of our patients who completed their five-year um, post-watchman visit, and they all happened to come on the same day. So we took this picture last year 
Um, and, you know, one of them you can see, she's a Cedars uh, volunteer. And uh, actually we have two or three now that are Cedars volunteers that have the Watchman implanted. And this is uh, my doctor that I work with, Dr. Saibal Carr. So any questions? Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. And, and for those on the line, we do um, we are a little bit over the hour, but we do want to answer your question. So um, if you stay on the line, I know we received a number of questions um, regarding the um, reimbursement landscape for Watchmen, um, as well as the registry. So um, I'm going to invite, we have a couple of Boston Scientific experts here. So I'm going to invite them um, to maybe answer some of these questions. And then we're also monitoring the Q&A. If we don't uh, answer your question on the line, we will make sure that we connect you um, with a Boston Scientific representative to make sure you get your question answered. Um, so with that, um, regarding the registry, um, Randy Anderson, I'm going to ask you, we had a couple of questions. So can you, first of all, um, is there a National Watchman Registry? There is a registry that is going to be administered by NCDR. It is called the LAAO registry, O for occlusion. Uh, but the NCDR LAAO registry will uh, be open for business on December 17th of this year. So it will start. It will be live. Um, if your account would like to uh, sign up for that registry, you can do so starting on December 17th. Um, I, you can work with your uh, watchman representative and that person can give you the, uh, the link if you like or we'll figure out a way to get you the link after this call. The link will take you to the NCDR page that has details on the registry. It has a, uh, the patient data collection form that you can download take a look at that. It's uh, quite lengthy. It's 15 pages long. Uh, and there's also an, uh, an FAQ document that is on that page available for downloading. So that all starts on uh, December 17th. And the price for enrollment is uh, $15,000 payable to NCDR. That is a, an annual fee. Uh, I'll, I'll venture to guess or hazard a guess that all of you are involved in one flavor of an NCDR or another. If you're involved in NCDR, the uh, enrollment process is actually very simple. You just fill out a few forms and then put together your purchase order and get that in. And then it takes about two weeks of administrative turnaround uh, with the NCDR folks to get your account up and running. Now let me say this. There is no requirement now for you to sign up and, and get that registration up and running in your account. Uh, if you're familiar with what CMS is proposing, and I know Deb will touch on this in a bit when she talks about reimbursement, if you're familiar with uh, what the NCDR proposal looks like, it's, uh, it looks like it's going to mandate that there will be a registry for uh, LAAC patients or Watchman patients, that you'll need to en enroll those patients into the registry um, that is a proposal at this point. We expect that to actually remain in the final decision. So I think it's a very safe bet that you'll have to be involved in the LAAO registry at some point in the future, but um, that won't be mandated until the final NCD uh, comes out sometime in early February, and then there'll be an effective date after that. So between now and, and February, let's say, there's no solid requirement for you to uh, get the registry up and running in your account. If you'd like to do so and, um, you know, get used to the, the, the data collection form where you find those particular data elements, because it is longer than the, the TAVR or the MitraClip one, it is quite lengthy. So you may want to certainly take a look at it now, get familiar with it, and uh, whether or not you want to sign up uh, immediately is, is really the call of your, of your facility. But again, it's not something that you'll have to do until uh, probably late Q1, I, I, would, I would think. So Randy, just to, just to confirm a couple of questions. So once the uh, national coverage determination is in place, let's say it's the latter part of February, 
that at that point, each watchman site will be required to participate in the NCDR um, as opposed to doing their own type of registry? Yes, I, th that is still yet to be determined, but I, if, uh, I think it's a very safe bet that we will, that CMS will say the NCDR registry is the registry that, that collects all the data elements they're looking for, et cetera. You know, just like folks are involved with the uh, ICD or the PCI or the, the TVT registries, the, the NCDR registries seem to be kind of the gold standard that, uh, that CMS goes to. Understood. And just to clarify, people are asking if contracts or procedures are on hold until this final decision is in place. And obviously the answer is no. Accounts are currently um, implanting and for the most part getting reimbursed for the procedures, although you know those dollars are at risk until that NCD is in place. Yeah, that's correct. Um, the NCD, uh, I'm sorry, did somebody have a comment? No, uh, I wanted to say one of the, one of the Things that uh, I saw a question regarding was the NIH stroke scale for the registries that going to be required, and I didn't see that on the forms that you uh, that I got from Nino. Um, there was no requirement for NIH stroke scale um, on there. It was only for the Rankin score and for the Bartel index score, and that's really huge because uh, NIH stroke scale. Um, you know, require certification that, you know, you have to do online. Um, and so that's a big thing. I, I was happy to see that the NIH stroke scale was, assessment was not part of the registry. And um, it does show up to two-year follow-up on these patients. That was a surprise to me because, you know, um, the other one we have, or MitraClip right now, is only a one-year follow-up. So um, this was surprising to see that they want two-year follow-ups on these patients. And um, not everything that is on those forms, I know those forms look really daunting, but um, not everything has to be done. It's obviously, um, you know, if, if the patient's medical history requires it. Um, one of the questions was also regarding labs pre-procedure, what's the window? And, um, you know, that's up to the institution, but our cat lab usually likes to have labs um, within a month for PCIs, but for other structural procedures, they're okay with up to six months as long as the lab values are normal. The INR obviously has to be, you know, um, with, if the patient's on Coumadin, the INR has to be within two days. You know, they have to be off and then they'll, but the other labs, if they're stable, there's not any problem with doing them ahead of time. Okay. And then also yeah. another question that uh, pertaining to my talk was about uh, endocarditis prophylaxis post-implant. Uh, I do recommend, um, you know, prophylaxis prior to dental work for up to six months after the device is implanted. We've just been, you know, doing that routinely from uh, our other structural procedures and we follow the same thing for watchmen. Yeah, great. Right. And, and, Sorry uh, about that. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries, Asma. Um, there, there was one other question regarding IRBs and consent around the the LAAO registry. Um, this is addressed in the in in the uh, NCDR FAQ that's online. Um, but the the answer to that is the the NCDR got this registry um, reviewed by sort of an independent IRB called the Chesapeake Research Review. They reviewed it and they determined that the NCDR does not require local IRB approval and they also uh, waived HIPAA authorization or they waived um, uh, the, the informed consent requirement for, for patients. Now, obviously every, every hospital's got their own requirements. If your hospital's willing to accept what this independent IRB what their recommendations are, i.e., no, no IRB review required, no patient consent required. If your hospital is willing to accept that, then you're fine. If your hospital doesn't accept that and wants to run things through their own procedure, then obviously that's, uh, that's your prerogative. But the, uh, the registry was reviewed by an independent reviewer. Uh, yeah, another, question, another question about the, the industry being retroactive. 
that's un that's unclear. I, I think the way retroactivity might work out is if the when the final NCD decision comes out, and let's say the effective date is the first of March next year. If uh, you are enrolling patients after the first of March, technically they need to be then put into this registry as a condition for reimbursement. If you are not enrolled in the registry and you know you don't get enrolled into the registry until the first of April, but you enrolled patients after the first of March, it would behoove you to go back and get those patients that were that you implanted the first of March going forward and make sure that you, in effect, retroactively uh, get them enrolled into the registry. And, and that's fine to do. So, you know, that would be, I think, prudent. I know that CMS does offer some kind of a grace period. Uh, that's unclear as to what exactly that means or how long that'll be. But I think uh, once you know what the effective date is of the NCD, I would begin at least filling out that form for your patients that receive the Watchman procedure, and then once you're up and running with the registry, you'll, you'll have the data, you can go back and, and enter them into the registry. Okay, and again, uh, a question about cases that have been done between now and that effective date of the NCD, will you need to go back and enroll them into the registry? I think it's safe to say no, because that is not right now a condition of approval. Um, you can certainly go back and do so if, you know, for the, for the advancement of science and you want to get that data into the registry, but I don't believe it will be a requirement. And again, I know we're running over time, and Asma, I know um, your time, just like the audience, is precious. Do you, do you have time to stay for a few more questions? Um, yes, I'm trying to just actually look over some of the questions and make sure I get them all answered. Um, yes, and we will. Um, we we are lucky enough that we will um, have access to this Q and A, so we can absolutely get these questions out to um, to you, Ozma, as well as to um, the Watchman field team as well, so that we make sure that we answer all of the questions. Um, if, well, if we're not one of the them. one of the questions that's important, somebody asked. Um, if a physician can decide to use a NOAC instead of Coumadin post-procedure? And uh, the answer to that would be no. I think, you know, in the IFU, it, it, it mentions Coumadin post-procedure, right? And so when patients ask me this question also, um, I tell them, you know, the NOACs don't have a reversal agent. Um, Coumadin is something that, you know, we can do blood testing, we can reverse the effects of Coumadin, and, you know, that's what's used in the clinical studies, and that is what we're doing post-procedure. So, as I said, we're trying to keep the data very clean for the registry, and I think it's important that we all, you know, try to maintain that. And to complement that, Osma, again, this is Melissa Maris from, from Boston mm -hmm. Scientific. Our labeling um, is clear that, that patients need to be on, on warfarin. So, I think that, that very much complements your experience. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, in the interest of time, I do want to um, answer questions. We did get a number of questions about um, reimbursement, and we do have Deb Maurer, the Boston Scientific um, Health Economics and Reimbursement, one of our experts here. Um, so, Deb, maybe I can ask you to maybe just provide us a, a general update on CMS, that proposed language, um, and any information that, that you can share. Yeah, so thanks, Melissa. Um, we've already talked a lot about the proposed NCD, so I think everybody's pretty familiar with the fact that <clears throat> on uh, November 10th, Medicare did um, issue a proposed national coverage determination for the Watchman procedure. Once they issue that proposal, then there's a 30-day um, comment period, and so we're ending that comment period actually today. Um, we're very pleased that they're, that they're um, covering Watchman. Um, we did have some questions about the national coverage determination, however, and we are seeking clarification on those issues that we had we had um, questions on. And we're also um, submitting comments to to, um, to Medicare regarding the NCD. So we've done a lot of work um, just to make it to hopefully the the final product will be very clear for everyone. 
Um, there are seven conditions in that NCD that need to be met. None of them were really um, surprises to us. So, um, and of course, one of them that we've talked a lot about is the, is the registry. Um, there's also um, requirements for physician training. There's requirements for um, work done with the patient, face-to-face -face work, and, and those kinds of things. So um, the, the final decision, we expect to become effective the middle of February, and then that's when the requirement for the registry will be effective for all of you. So um, more on that to come once the final rule is, is uh, released the middle of February. So what we have now is proposed language. We'll have more information and, and we'll be able to provide, for, as a, from a company standpoint, we'll be able to provide more clarity Absolutely. in, in February. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, great. And I know, right. um, Asma, there's a, a number of questions, obviously, for you with, with your experience regarding reimbursement. Um, so I guess the, the main one that I've, I've seen a couple of different flavors of are, are you receiving reimbursement now, Ozma, and are you receiving reimbursement from both um, Medicare, uh, Medicare managed plans, as well as private payers? Um, yes, we've not had any problems with our Medicare patients. And in fact, I, I was wondering about the question I saw earlier about do we get authorization for Medicare patients? You know, for Medicare, you don't have to get an authorization, so I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, and then also the managed Medicare patients, those are pretty easy to get reimbursement. We've not had any issues with reimbursement on these patients. We are, so I, I mean, think, yeah. we're getting paid. I'm not sure what, you know, why there should be an issue. It is, it is covered by Medicare. Um, one of the things I think that's really important is that the physicians make that compelling story to the insurance company as to why this patient needs the watchman. As of right now, most of the insurance companies have, um, they don't have coverage policies, both, so they consider it an investigational device. And that's what right. we're doing when we submit for prior authorization is we're asking for an exception to their current policy of non-coverage. And we're mm -hmm. asking for an exception for specific reasons. And that's where it's, it's very important that the physician make that compelling story as to why this device is necessary for this patient. And that, in, once you have that documented in the medical record, should you get a denial, that will also be supporting evidence to manage any appeal that, that needs to be done. Great. Yeah. And I think, Asma, you, you covered and you talked about your pre-authorization um, process. Um, but maybe you can, you can touch on that maybe one more time for, for this audience. So for Medicare patients, we, we don't require authorization. Medicare patients don't need to have anything, you know, submitted. So um, the only time that we re put in an authorization is for private pay, with, you know, whether it's Blue Cross, Cigna, United Care. And th these are all um, private payers. And because this is coded as an inpatient procedure, that's why you need to um, get the authorization. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't even have to do that. And uh, like I said, you're, you are going to get a denial, and then you're going to do a peer-to-peer, -peer, and that's also going to get denied. And then you'd have to go to that third step. And then that's when you, you know, write the appeal letter and, and you, you know, just say, we are requesting, you know, approval for this patient who, who has, you know, problems with anticoagulation therapy. And be very clear in the letter what that is and then you should get approval. I, I am um, getting a denial even after a third request for a patient um, that, you know, doesn't have any problems with bleeding. He doesn't have a risk of stroke. His only reasoning for getting watch one was because he has coronary disease and is on aspirin and plavix therapy and didn't want to continue Coumadin also. And that's one patient that I'm having difficulty getting cover, you know, authorization. And um, it may be that we never get that. I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that patient still. Mm -hmm. But most so of them, we are getting approval. Right. 
That's that's fantastic, Arthur. One of the questions. Yeah, and then the question, uh, I saw a couple regarding the Rankin and Bartel scoring. That is required for all patients, yes, at, at, on their baseline visit. And then for the subsequent visits, um, you know, if they've had any kind of neurologic event, then you would want to do those assessments again. But otherwise, no. And I was doing the NIH stroke scale assessments on all these patients because I have, you know, the certification when I used to do them for the other studies that we do where you need an NIH um, stroke skill assessment. Um, I was routinely doing them on everybody, but, um, you know, it, it's kind of something that I decide to do. If the patient has a history of stroke, I think it's a good idea to do a NIH stroke skill assessment and definitely list what their baseline deficits are because then when they come back after the Watchman implant, and, you know, sometimes you have these events, you're not quite sure, is it a stroke, and, and, you know, until you get that CT or MRI, you're not going to know, but at least if you have some uh, physical exam findings that you document at baseline and then you have them, you know, later on, then you know that it's not a new stroke, uh, that, that it was there already. So it's, it becomes important for those patients that have a history of stroke. Great. Thank you, Asma. So I think um, we are coming right up to the time here, so I know um, Deb has a couple of um, resources and, and important information here for folks. I want to make sure she gets that opportunity. Yep, so just real quick, Asma, you had a good point in that traditional Medicare you don't need a preauthorization for, and actually Medicare won't give you a preauthorization. But for those mm -hmm. Medicare, <laughs> Medicare Advantage plans, you do need to seek preauthorization. So any payer other than traditional Medicare, you'll want to get preauthorization. And we have many tools for you to use. We've got a preauthorization template. We have a, a, a template that you can use for um, doing appeals. Um, and you can, you can certainly get this information from your, your watchman reps. So lots of resources for you as far as reimbursement goes. So I know the, the question about who's writing this letter is it's me writing the letter uh, on behalf of my physician, but you know everybody's going to be different. Um, if your physician doesn't have the time to sit down and write this appeal letter, you may have to you know do it yourself or you know obviously get somebody to look at it before you send it off. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Asma. Well, I know that we are right up against the time here, so. Asma, I want to say thank you so very much for, for sharing your, your knowledge and your experience with us, for making the time today, making the extra time. Um, thank you to the audience as well, for all of you who registered for this event and who have been asking fantastic questions. So we can have a fantastic dialogue here amongst the coordinator group and make sure that we are providing you with the information and the resources um, that you need to, to support um, the Watchman therapy in your uh, in your practice. So again, thank you to everyone. We will be um, following up. Any questions we did not answer here, we will be following up with you to answer those questions um, and look for more information um, on when this webcast uh, is available on demand. So thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.